pioneer, enigma, and inspiration, Don F. Drager's legacy still shapes the way we approach and engage in the martial arts. Born in 1922, he was a military veteran of World War II and Korea and participated in the Battle of Iwo Jima. Captain in the U.S. Marine Corps, pioneer of physical training methods, practitioner of modern Japanese martial ways, the first non-Japanese student of several classical martial arts, author of definitive books and the founder of a study of human combative behavior called hoplology, instructor of Katori Shinto Ryu Kenjutsu, he also held high ranks in Shindo Musuryu, Judo, Kendo, and Aikido, among other arts. We still do not know the full extent of his achievements by his untimely death in 1982, but he was, through his perseverance, abilities, and example, known even to the Japanese as Sensei. Today, Hunter Chip Armstrong, Liam Keeley, Alex Bennett, and Phil Relnick have gathered to talk about the man, his work, and his legacy. Hunter Chip Armstrong began training in martial arts with various karate systems in the early 60s. On moving to Japan, he continued his study under Higaona Morio Sensei, Gojuryu, at the famous Yoyogi Dojo. I first went to Japan late 69, 1970. I met Don Drager actually in Hawaii about 1975. At that time, he was doing lectures at the University of Hawaii. Uh, I found out about the lectures. I had read his books, so I made a point of meeting him. And from there, uh, he directed me towards going back to Japan and it, specifically getting into the weapons arts. I was a karate guy, although the correct term would be karate. Most of us refer to it at that time as karate. Uh, Drager changed my direction, and it was his influence to go into the older Japanese Ryu, which the only reason I knew about them was his books. Armstrong began his foray into Japan's Koryu Bujutsu, starting in Shindo Musoryu-jo at the Rembukan Dojo in Tokyo in 1977. In 1980, he began training in Tatsumi-ryu. In 1985, while living in Nagoya, he was accepted by Kato Isao Sensei to begin training in Shinkage-ryu Heiho, Owari-kan-ryu Sojutsu. While his main focus was in Japanese fighting arts, he also explored other arts including Chen and Yang styles of Tai Chi, as well as Bagua and Zing Yi. We went back to Japan, and as soon as I got back, it was about 1976, 77, uh, he invited me to start working with him and his group in the International Hoplological Research Center. We did our first uh, field trip. We being, I joined his first uh, field trip, 1978. And then we did uh, two, three more trips, Sumatra and Sri Lanka. From there, shortly after uh, the Sri Lanka trip, Drager became very ill and uh, subsequently passed away. At that point, and over the next two year period, it appeared that I was gonna have to be the one that continued the work we were doing. So I, I took over the direction of the IHRC uh, and then changed the name to the International Hoplology Society. In that endeavor, he has conducted field research in Japan, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Sri Lanka, and India, researching both traditional fighting arts as well as modern variants. He was very concerned about the the longevity of the Koryu. He was afraid they were going to die out in Japan. So at that time when I first met him and the other foreigners who were practicing along with him, uh, we all wanted to go into Katori Shintori because that's what he did. He didn't want serious foreigners to be practicing all the same thing. He wanted to uh, direct them to different other Koryu he felt deserved to be preserved. So at that time, although I wanted to go into Shinto Ryu, I was uh, introduced to Tatsumi Ryu. Uh, the, the teacher at that time was uh, Kato 
Takeshi Sensei, who has since passed away. A very fine gentleman himself. Other friends of mine were kind of oriented towards, let's say, Yagyu and so forth. But yeah, he was definitely trying to get us into different areas. When I, when I first met him in Honolulu, he introduced me to the concept of the Koryu. He actually sat down with me. We spent two hours watching his films. And I had been planning to go back to Japan primarily to do karate again. And he suggested I, I pick out a few Koryu I would like to see. So I, I picked out five from those films. He wrote letters of introduction to the teachers of those films. I went to Japan and I spent the next three months going throughout Japan being interviewing. I thought I was interviewing them. They were interviewing me to see if I was acceptable. And uh, yeah, he was definitely very, very helpful. Like I say, he, he very much directed my future course in what we were doing. Yeah, I think now there's so much foreign foreign interest and also the interest of the Japanese themselves has expanded quite a bit. So uh, I think there's a lot of benefit from what's come from Draeger's stimulus, but the, the, you can't really put them all in the same cookie cutter pattern. There's quite a bit of difference between the different traditions. I think it, not just his involvement with the Kobudo Shinkokai, but his three books stimulated a huge amount of foreign interest. The Japanese didn't care. They didn't read the books. But we had foreigners coming to Japan who were specifically looking at Koryu. For most Japanese, they don't know there was a Koryu. But now you have foreigners who are wandering around the country looking for a Koryu to train in. And at that time, in the 70s, the Japanese were still suffering from uh, the defeat of World War II. So their, let's say, self-identity was not as strong as it became a few years later. But as a result, all these foreigners are showing an interest in increasing the Japanese own self-perception of the value of their culture. Actually, one of my main directions here is the, the Koryu have significant value. They have very significant value. Uh, for the past, well, since 1998, I've been working with U.S. military and law enforcement. We work specifically on training people who have never been in high-stress combat situations, and you're trying to prepare them for that environment. And the Koryu train, that's what it was for. These principles have been present in many traditional battlefield combat systems, in particular, the Koryu Bujutsu of the Sengoku period, but universally found in other martial and civil fighting cultures around the world. Now, what's happening in Japan today is Koryu, for the most part, I would say, and I describe it as being practiced as a museum artifact. It's on the shelf. And twice a week, we take it off the shelf, we polish it a little bit, and then we put it back on the shelf. All it is is a museum piece. But the Koryu has lessons that I have looked at, and I have very, I would say successfully, adjusted them for the modern technology of warfare. The guns are different. <laughs> We're not using swords and spears, but the humans, and their minds and their bodies are the same as 600 years ago, 1,000 years ago, and so forth. So that's a value that most people in the modern world, in Japan, certainly don't understand that, well, it's an old-fashioned koryu swordsmanship or whatever. It doesn't have anything to do with today. My, my opinion is exact opposite. It's of huge value, and even the Japanese are neglecting it. For the military, the Marine Corps, I coined the phrase, one mind any weapon. And the Marine Corps now uses that phrase for their, their commando units. And it's, it's far more important. The mind is far more important than the weapon. Thank you all for coming in today. Am I being heard okay? Everybody can hear me. All right. Uh, in a nutshell, what I'm going to start off with here is the Draeger legacy. I'm going to show a short video clip 
that in my mind portrays the essence of what Draeger saw in the Code of Ubujis. So let's see what happens. This is uh, a fairly well-known video clip now. It's a, it's a group of hunters in Africa. They're Dorobo, uh, subset of the Maasai. And they're actually not hunters, they're scavenging. They're armed with self bows. They're approaching a pride of lions who've just taken down their prey. Essentially what you're gonna see is through dominance of mindset, not physical attributes, not the ability to rip a lion apart with your bare hands, but through the dominance of mind, these men are gonna walk up and take the meat away from the lions. This is a human capability. This is something that allowed mankind to not only survive in a harsh world, but to dominate some of the most fierce animals we could face. The lions aren't so afraid that they take off totally. They're going to turn around and watch, and all of a sudden it comes to them. Why are we running? It only takes him a few seconds to carve off a wildebeest haunch. So purely by dominance of behavior, dominance of mindset, demeanor, these three men have sub subdued a pride of lions and taken their prey. Drager's concept was that this was a behavior that he saw in his training. It was a behavior that he saw in certain experiences in his life. So let's, let's go back and take a look at that. You forgot to explain these things. Yep, the arrow. Oh, okay. Other way. Other way. That's Don Drager, as, as we've mentioned, very physically adept individual. He was, in more modern parlance, a stud. He was an early subscriber to weight training, wrote several books on resistance training for judo, I'm not going to go into great depth on the background. Uh, Phil Relnick is going to discuss that much more in depth. Started judo at the age of eight in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So that was his first introduction to the concept of martial arts. Entered the United States Marine Corps, became an officer in the Marine Corps, 1943. He fought, he fought through the Pacific War, was uh, involved in the Korean conflict, and eventually was retired, or actually what they call reduction in forces. He was riffed out of the Marine Corps, 1956. During that time in the Marine Corps, like I say, he fought in uh, the South Pacific, Korea. He was sent to Manchuria at the end of the war, and also did work in Cuba and South America. He went home for a short time and then made the decision that he's going to spend the rest of his retirement in Japan. Moved back to Japan, started up in judo again. He actually never left judo. He continued with judo, but because of his martial background, martial meaning military background, his experience in the battlefield, he developed a concept of martial capability that went beyond, you might say, the dojo. And that field he decided to de develop further was a field called hoplology, study of the development and evolution of human combative behavior. 
Well, he started with judo, with budo. He was looking eventually both at current systems and classical, let's say, historical systems. He was looking for insights and perspectives that would give him a better view on why do we fight the way we fight. I'm sure you can all figure what that is. These are all modern Budo systems. These are, are systems that are evolved specifically for the dojo. As he started shifting into more classical systems, he became more and more entranced by the Koryu, what he distinguished as Koryu Bujutsu, and to some extent the Koryu Budo. He eventually started working with, actually it was a very short time period, he started working with uh, Japan's uh, martial arts, traditional martial arts research society, the Kobudo Shinkokai. It was while working with them that his vision started expanding the type of research they were doing into a more, let's say, cross-cultural, global perspective. So he started looking into what aspects of other cultures' fighting systems can we utilize to get a better perspective on why and how humans fight? Yakuts, for those of you who aren't too familiar, Yakutian people are uh, Siberian, very closely related to the Mongols. They have a very distinctive martial culture, which hardly anybody knows about today. became apparent to Drager in the process of his work that there was a distinction between what we call martial arts popularly and civil combative systems. He came to find that many of the fighting arts and what we saw in other cultures were predominantly civilian systems. What we now in hoplology refer to as civilian combative systems. If you want to say civilian civil fighting arts, that's okay. But these civil systems are predominantly initially for self-defense. means they're not used on the battlefield. They're for protecting yourself, your family, your community, your village. And we distinguish between the individual and the group. And we distinguish whether systems are utilized with weapons or empty hands. This is an, a South Indian. This is Salambam generally found in Kerala and other areas of South India. It's a village stick fighting system. The sticks are very effective for use against predators for your sheep or against your sheep or who are interested in your sheep. It's also used against bandits and it's also become a sport and a display system. That's why the colored stick. This is Silat Hadimau in Indonesia, Sumatra, this particular group. You'll notice they're using blades. And the blades they're using are actually farm tools. They're uh, essentially machetes used for cutting brush, grass, what have you. But they also make great weapons for using for self-protection, particularly in village protection. Empty hand system. This is a a South Indian system as well. It's related to Salambam, but this is an empty hand system known as Kutuvarusai. A French, where's our French guy? A French system. By the way, you look at the postures and you'll see certain similarities. And this is something we were looking into. Human beings across the planet, for some reason, they use the same joints and the same body parts for striking one another as anywhere else in the world. So we start seeing commonalities. We, we do see distinctions in different societies. More often than not, we see the commonalities. Okinawan Karate Jutsu. This is Higoona Sensei. And this is not a martial system. This is a civil system. The tools or the weapons they use for their earlier version of Karate Jutsu were fishing tools, farm tools, not tools that we'd use on the battlefield. 
Those systems I was just pointing out were primarily aimed at civil, civil self-defense. Most combative systems used in civilian societies, particularly in today's age, are sport systems. All cultures throughout the world have age group wrestling. Anywhere you go in the world, you're going to find some version of grappling. This is Nubia, Africa, and it's a village pastoral people's wrestling, young men predominantly. This is some exotic Asian country that's really crowded, practicing their young men's grappling system. Difference here is rather than grappling, it's striking. But this is an evolution based off of the Okinawan karate jutsu that's turned predominantly to a sports system. I think we can all recognize that pretty readily. And again, as a sports system. Keep in mind that when we start, talk about it being sport or civil defense or what have you, we're not talking about its effectiveness. We're talking about a distinction in what its outcome is for, what its function is for. Drager started his life as a young judo man, but the most impacting experience on his life was as a Marine in combat. So that, that really drove his uh, research and his insights for the rest of his life. This is Captain Drager. He retired as a captain in 1956. This is in Korea. From his battlefield experience, he realized the importance of training the body and the mind for that lethal environment. Not the comfort of training for the sake and joy of improving yourself, but for a lethal environment. This became the foundation of what he was looking at in the Japanese Kodi. He started looking for Japan's traditional fighting arts that were aimed in that same direction. And he found them. Through his judo connections in Japan, he was introduced first to Shindo Muso Ryu and from there later on in Takatori Shinto Ryu. We'll skip that. It was during this period as well, as I said earlier, he became fascinated by the concept of extending that research and those concepts that he was picking up more and more of in his traditional Japanese studies he started looking at, are these going to be the same kind of concepts we find in other cultures? In Japan, he started a big furor in the early 70s when he wrote his three volumes on classical bujutsu, classical budo, modern bujutsu, and budo. That controversy was his distinction between bujutsu and budo. These are terms that weren't necessarily used the same way he implied they should be used. He referred to the bujutsu or buge, predominantly bujutsu, as battlefield systems. These are the systems that were used by the martial man in traditional Japan for not merely survival but dominance on the battlefield. These are quotes from his lectures. The buge were classical warrior entities designed for group protection through emphasis on fighting skills and concern for combat results. Bujutsu is a group solidarity, not the individual. It is not for self-protection. If any of you have been in the military in the past 10, 15, 20 years, you're well aware that military work is aimed at teamwork. The classical bougay were founded on the absolute necessity for warriors to live a stern, masculine kind of life. Realize that's not exactly PC at the moment, but predominant part of martial world was a man's world. Doesn't mean women can't do it, just means predominantly speaking, there were certain masculine values that were highly emphasized in martial societies. 
This is an old photo of Yagyu Shinkage Ryu, uh, late 19 or late 1800s. This was a battlefield tradition originally. Kanyu Sojutsu, originally also a battlefield tradition. Budo, non battlefield. According to Drager, Budo were of classical plebeian background, designed for self-perfection with an emphasis on development of an enlightened person. Budo is not combat, but spiritual cultivation for myself, not the group. Now keep in mind, Drager is not talking about the effectiveness of a system He's not talking about whether one is better than the other. He's using these as tools to give us a better perspective into both the systems, how the weapons are being used, most importantly, human behavior. Uh, I'm sure some of you, most, if not most of you, are familiar with Nakayama Hakudo, very famous EI practitioner, early 1900s. This is Udo. Kendo, I think. <laughs> Around that same time as he expanded his view into looking at a more uh, holistic view of combative behavior, he formed the International Hopological Research Center. He recruited a number of us, primarily Budo, foreign Budo practitioners in Japan and Hawaii, uh, among those were Phil Relnick, Dave Hall, uh, Larry Berry, later on uh, Liam Keeley came along, not too much later on, and myself. In this process where we started working early with Drager, we only had the vaguest idea of where he was going with it, but we were part of his formulation group. It became apparent that we were going to have to more carefully define the terms that most of us would naturally think we already understood. What exactly is a weapon? You know what a weapon is. At least you think you know what a weapon is. Hopologically, we're a little bit more restrictive in how we define it. What is a system? And again, inherently, we intuitively know what we mean when we say what is a combative system. But if you're going to do a study on these things and how people use weapons, are they really using a weapon? Is that really a system? Depends on how you define it. So hoplology decided we have to actually define these things. We look at a weapon, an artifact, the primary intended design and function of which is to inflict or be capable of inflicting death, injury, damage, or control in combative situations. The key components in this definition are primary intended design and function. Two elements. What did the maker of that weapon intend for it? And what does the user do with it? If I make what I call a combat knife, and it looks like every other knife, but I call it a combat knife. Does that make it a weapon? Virtually every culture on the planet has used knives or still uses knives as tools. Nobody is going to take a knife onto the battlefield as a primary weapon. So on the hopological definition, very few knives that are weapons. Great majority of them are weapon usable tools. Huge distinction between a knife and a sword. Why does a sword maker make a sword? For what end is that sword? For most of human history, that sword is designed for combat. System, a body of organized, codified, repeatable actions, techniques, behaviors, and attitudes. Behaviors and attitudes. The planful design and function of which is to be used in or as preparation for combative applications. And there's that terminology again, design and function. 
What's the system designed for by its originator? What's it used for by its practitioner? So again, these, these are not qualitative st statements. These are definitions that we use as tools to help us assess a system and what it's being used for, its application. In defining combative systems, we found the need to further delineate the functional ends. What's the outcome of the system? The applications. The concept of this dis distinction was derived from Drager's d distinction, the dichotomy between Budo and Buddhist. Budo was for what purposes? Oh yeah, that was for self-development. Bujutsu, as Drager saw it, was for effectiveness of protecting your group and dominating on the battlefield. So we started defining that further in the case of the hopological perspective. Here, rather than Budo and Bujutsu, because most societies don't have the type of martial culture that Japan has, we look at the distinction between martial and civil systems. Again, martial are those that are used for the battlefield. Civil are those used by individuals in the civilian world. Martial combative systems are those whose primary intended design and function are aimed at application to the military battlefield. Civil combative systems are those whose primary intended design and function are aimed at civilian-based outcomes. There are only a limited number of applications in both areas. If we look at martial systems, we look at battlefield mortal combat, i.e. somebody's probably gonna die. We have two main versions, single combat and group combat. You look at a Roman legionnaire fighting on the battlefield, he's fighting in a group, but how does he fight as an individual in that group? You look at a modern Marine Corps fire team, it's a four-man team of riflemen and automatic riflemen and others. They fight as a group. These are the only two possible uses for martial combat. Civilian combat applications, wider range. And as I said earlier, civilian systems are the most common in the world, particularly today. Primary early on was civil self-defense, protecting myself, my family, my community. Group self-defense, single self-defense. Dual, and this is something people tend to ignore. Dual was a major civil self, or self-combative system, a civil combative system. Try saying that 10 times fast. Civil combative system found in many cultures. Agonistic, essentially a overly academic word for sports and competition, athletic endeavor. Psycho-spiritual development, systems that have evolved to develop the individual's spirit, mental energy, universal harmony, et cetera, et cetera. Drager, of course, linked the martial civil dichotomy with the Bujutsu Budo, Budo split. Bujutsu equated to martial systems for the battlefield, civil related to Budo for the development of the individual capability. This is a modern martial system. Now, interesting in here is they're using a bayonet. These are young Marines of the 3rd Recon Battalion based in Okinawa. They're training in a bayonet system. They have absolutely no intention of going onto the battlefield or fighting anywhere at any time with a, bat with a bayonet if they can handle it. They can shoot somebody, they'll shoot somebody. <laughs> Why the bayonet training? Remember we had that concept of behavior and attitudes. We'll come back to that. This is a sport system. This is a civil sport system. We look at what they're doing, we say, oh, they got swords, they got weapons. Do they? What does that implement? What's it designed for? What the maker designed it for? And what is the user using it for? 
In the process of looking at these distinctions between martial and civil, we found behavioral dis differences that parallel those distinctions. And these are particularly in the area of aggression. I think we can all agree that basically combative behavior is an aggressive behavior. The studies we initially looked at were predominantly done by animal behavioralists out of Austria, but essentially what they showed was that hunting mammals display two distinct types of behavior, predatory hunting behavior and affective, which means emotional aggression, which is used for very, very distinct reasons. So affective behavior is a high emotional content. Get real excited, get all juiced up, full of adrenaline, quick exchange of bites and blows, and the fight's over. Cool mind behavior, that predatory behavior, is tracking, stalking, and taking down the prey. The cool mind allows the predator to think, to plan, to work as a team. It's literally evolved to last a long period of time. That affective behavior is literally evolved to be very short term. If we're hunting a long, far moving prey, we don't wanna be overexcited about it in the initial stage and burn out. Affective aggression is primarily intraspecies, intraspecies, between two different species. It's the predator cat going after the gazelle. Generally speaking, most hunting mammals don't show affective, or I'm sorry, intraspecies, within the species. Generally speaking, what we're gonna use it for is to establish dominance within our group. I'm going after a member of my group. I'm a young male cat, a pride of lions, and I'm going to establish who gets to be the next top lion. Pack of wolves, you'll see the same thing. Any group pack hunting mammal will go through these behaviors. Even if they're not a pack hunting mammal, you'll see these behaviors. Key components, it's aimed at intimidation. So threatening posture, it's a display posture. It's not an action posture. Threatening verbalization, growls, snarling, calling somebody a son of a bitch, same thing. Eye contact, eye contact is for social interaction. Keep that in mind. An attack is usually an angry attack, it's very quick and short term. Often results in relatively little damage, why? If I'm a hunting pack, and every time I get challenged or challenge another hunting mammal in my group and I damage it or kill it, what happens to the value of my hunting group? I'm gonna start defeating my own self in the process. Its primary aim is establishing dominance and a hierarchical order in that group. Cat's not a hunting, or it's not a pack animal, but it is a hunting cat mammal. And this is affective behavior. The snarling, the ears laid back, the body turned sideways. That's not an action posture, it's a display posture. And you'll see similarities in these display postures across, across a wide range of species. Two foxes, two bears, more bears, sea lions. Same basic display in all cases, same verbalization. Lions. Predatory aggression. Interspecies. This is the, the hunter going after the prey. I gotta think, I'm gonna use a teamwork, I'm gonna plan ahead. The aim is to hunt and kill for food, so it's literally survival based. Posture is efficient for action and movement. Not for threat. No sound during the stalk or the track down. Might be sound at the moment of attack, just purely as a weapon. Eyes are used for information gathering. 
If I'm the lion and I'm sneaking up on the gazelle, I don't make eye contact with the gazelle. Cool mind behavior is controlled. They actually wired up cats, dogs, wolves, etc., etc., back in the 40s and 50s and watched the neural scans on the activity. In the hunting behavior, they were flat mind. The attack is to kill, not win a competition or a fight. I'm going to win, I'm going to eat. I don't win, I might die. Stalking posture. It's aimed at movement, stealth. It allows the ability, literally the posture lends itself to the neural system's ability to think and plan. Teamwork. I often use this when I was lecturing to young Marines and I'd say, what do you see? Oh, I see a bunch of lions getting ready to attack a water buffalo. Water buffalo are fairly powerful animals. What I saw here was four or five young drunk Marines all ganging up to beat up a bouncer. The bouncer's probably going to win. This is not good teamwork. Predatory behavior is used for killing. Again, not for competing. Human combative behavior very closely parallels that of hunting mammals. Why? We're a hunting mammal. We are a pack hunting mammal. Our effective combative behavior is for personal social interaction. Two young guys going at it in a bar. What do we do? We bow up, make faces, eye contact, verbalization. We establish dominance. One side or the other is going to back off or it turns into a fist fight. Especially without the weapons at hand, relatively little damage is done. More often than not, somebody backs off. Predatory combative behavior in humans is for hunting. The ability to hunt, especially as a group, is based on teamwork, planning, and being able to see what's going to happen and where I'm going to do it. Now, one other distinctive aspect of predatory hunting. In human evolution, as a successful hunter-gatherer in various parts of the world at different times, we started overpopulating our resources. So if somebody else's group starts coming into my area, how am I going to deal with that invading group? I've got two choices. I can bow up, get angry, call them names, and hope they'll back off. Guess how successful that is. Or I can hunt them. We became very good at looking at other humans. We have the psychological capability of turning other humans, especially in groups, into something less than human. And we see that over and over and over again today. Shiites don't look at Sunnis the same way. To a Sunni, a Shiite is less than human. Not too long ago, an Irish Catholic and an Irish Protestant, and frankly, I can't tell the difference, were willing to kill each other. Why? Well, that, that Protestant's not exactly human. Serbs and Croats. And they will literally do things that I wouldn't do to an animal, never mind another human. So this ability, which we call pseudo-predatory combative behavior, allows us, in fact, maybe even stimulates us to engage in a form of battle that no other animal engages in. Human affective behavior. You can recognize these behaviors immediately. I'm afraid to say these are predominantly American, but I think anywhere you go in the world, you're going to see exactly the same. I could show this to a Papua New Guinean, and he'd know exactly what was going on. We've seen that. We might even have engaged in something like that when we were, what, 18? One too many beers? 
Think about it. Look at the posture. Look at the distance. If you're a weapon trained individual, how, how often would you let yourself get that close to somebody? Why is that even a behavior we engage in? Because it keeps us from killing him. And it keeps him from killing us. We're just not very effective with that kind of range, distance, and posture. It lowers our ability to move effectively. We still be violent, but it has strong inhibitions against carrying out that violence. Athletic glory, that's my title for that one. We did a, a training program up in Seattle, Washington for the Washington State Criminal Justice Training Center. And we were working with young police cadets, not young, these guys are from 24 to 35. And the, the name of the course was, uh, essentially it was self-control through meditation. We were lying. We would take these young cadets, put them in a room where they were apparently getting a call for disturbance. Young officer would come through the door, he'd knock on the door, bad guy would say, come in. Officer would say, uh, we got a call for a disturbance here, can I help you, sir? At which point, the nasty guy, that's me, would pull a knife out and attack him. That's affective response. It's an emotional response. It's not a trained response. It's not a hunting response. It's a high affective, highly emotional, dysfunctional response. Generally speaking, I did 35 officers that day. I killed all of them with six, seven, eight knife blows. The gun he's got on me was after about the ninth knife stab. Point being here wasn't to show them how good I was, maybe a little bit showing them how bad they were, but getting them to understand the difference between cool mind and emotional arousal. Similar situation in the Philippines many, many years ago. Off-duty Filipino officer, he's called here. He, he arrives in a market area outside of Manila. He sees, if you're familiar with the term amok, I won't go into details. Essentially, a guy who's gone bananas with a weapon. He pulls his off-duty weapon out. The amok is chasing him down. He's, what, 8, 10 feet away. The officer missed all six shots in that revolver. Guy with a much lower technology weapon because he's single-minded, albeit psychopathic at that stage. The officer is highly jacked up emotionally, has no combative effectiveness of it all, and in spite of having a much stronger weapon, is taken down, killed, and his wife, his wife, his firearm taken away. That was a Freudian slip if there ever was one. <laughs> Human predatory behavior traits we're looking at are the same as for the hunting mammal. Cool mind, cool mind. And I can't overemphasize that. What killed that policeman was emotional arousal. Stalking posture for efficient movement, not display. Little or no vocalization. If I'm facing this young fellow here and I start talking to him and mouthing off to him and he mouths off back to me, what are we doing? We're socializing. It might be aggressive socializing, but that's what it is, it's socializing. If we're really gonna go at it, what should happen? Fight should be over before it starts. Minimal eye contact, why? Eye contact, we are wired to look at somebody in the eyes, I'm looking at you guys. It's a social interaction, we're communicating. The lion, let's, let's look at the wolf. The wolf does not make eye contact with Bambi. We're not gonna socialize first and then I'm gonna rip your throat out. Vision is used specifically for judging distance, assessment of possible outcomes, and planning. 
These are human predatory behaviors, stalking. And you'll see that same stalking posture among African bushmen, Japanese bear hunters, other northern uh, Kenya area hunting teamwork. And I'll show you later, again, American military. Pseudo-predatory behavior, that slightly odd distinction where we can hunt other humans. And I already explained that. This is that Marine Corps stalking posture. Now, what do you see here? Pseudo-predatory mindset. The ability of maintaining a predator mindset in the face of affective arousal. Police officers on the left, what are they looking at? They're not looking at their opponent. They're, they're using their eyes for vision and assessment. They're collecting data. They're not establishing eye contact with the bad guy because they don't want to socialize with him. He's not a bad guy. We're going to try not to hurt him. Okay. Now, key components coming in here. Keep that behavioral aspect in there. What allows a human to be a hunter? The brain. What else? The weapon. There's nobody that I am familiar with anywhere in the world that hunts with their bare hands. At no time in human evolution did we hunt with our bare hands. We're slow, we're weak, and we have no natural weapons to speak of. Although I would never say that to my wife. All right. The human brain is what makes humans the dominant mammal. We go back to those three African scavengers at the beginning. There is one particular weapon that we have used for over 400,000 years. Consider that on an evolutionary impact basis. 400,000 years of using the spear. We have archeological evidence of crafted, balanced, selected wood, handheld spears going back over 400,000 years. The capability of using that weapon in facing a hunting situation. And hunting situation could be, while I'm hunting the deer, the bear is hunting me. The ability to use that weapon in the face of a life-death environment. The weapon itself doesn't do the job. We saw that with the Filipino police officer. The weapon doesn't do the job. It's the mind of the man wielding the weapon. I would go into this much more deeply if we had much more time, but I want a simple concept understood here. The biomechanics of weapon use ties directly into the nervous system and the use of the brain. If my posture is bowed up, shoulders thrown back, chin jutted forward, guess what it's telling my brain? Dominance, anger. If I go into a stalking posture, guess what it's telling my brain? Keep it cool, be effective. And this is a huge, huge importance. How I move, how I stand affects how I see, perceive, assess, and act. If my brain goes wired, guess what happens? I go bodily dysfunctional. Where are we going with this? This is a Kaladi Payat spear system. European spear. See something similar? Posture. Japanese spear. Posture. In all these cases, spear does basically the same thing. It's a long pointy instrument that we try to penetrate somebody's body with. Key component is not the physical technique. What do you see? Spear. It's not about the weapon, it's about training the man, mind and body to be as efficiently, behaviorally effective as possible. 
Same spear. These are live blade trainings, by the way. Combat mindset. As I said, behavior and biomechanics closely connected. Combat mindset is based on over 400,000 years of spear use. Posture and body action affect behavior. Behavior as well can affect posture and body action. Back to the connection with Cody Ubujis. We've come a long way. Close personal combat systems for the battlefield have developed in many cultures around the world. All cultures. Any culture of any size that was large enough to build up military groups for battlefield combat had systems for battlefield combat. Unusually in Japan, and due to unique combination of geographical and cultural circumstances, Japan's traditional battlefield system were brought to an unusually high level of behavioral and physical capabilities. It's not because the Japanese are smarter, stronger, faster, or different human beings than the rest of us. Purely through historical circumstance, they had a period of time where the martial culture, this is in Japan, Military man, the military class is at the highest level of a society hierarchy of any culture you've seen. The warrior was at the top end. Most societies didn't have a warrior at the top end of society for a long period of time. Europeans had the knights, the Indians had the kshatriya. But Japan was one of the few that had the military class at the upper end. It gave them an opportunity to refine their jobs as efficiently as possible. In spite of the many shared traits with other of the world's combative systems, battlefield combative systems, classical martial traditions are unique. Their depth of understanding the demands and needs for battlefield combat, combat were profound, and their ability to address that training was remarkable. Simply put, technology has improved tremendously. Human beings aren't any different. Now, about 19, about 1998, I was contacted by the United States military to help, particularly the Marine Corps, help develop a new close combat training program. The idea was not develop new techniques for using bayonets or empty hand fighting or anything else. It was to develop the mind to deal with com combat stress. I'm a young Marine, I'm going into combat for the first time. I'm probably one of the best trained professional soldiers for firearms combat produced. There are other good professional soldiers, believe me. I'm using the Marines a specific reason. They're very well trained. But you take an 18, 19, 20-year-old young man who's never been in a fist fight in his culture, and you put him on the battlefields of Fallujah or in Afghanistan, what's going to prepare him? His skills are good. The mind and the behavior, not prepared. We saw this in law enforcement as well. In my experience, and based on a lot of what I learned from Drager, when the Marine Corps contacted me and the work we'd been doing in hoplology, I saw the perfect opportunity for the first time. Previously, we'd always been descriptive. We look at Indian, Indonesian, Zulu, Japanese, Chinese, Apache fighting systems. We'd, all we did was describe them. We extracted the commonalities. We looked at the distinctions. There are far more commonalities. And the commonalities pointed us not towards the technical side, but the behavioral. And the most fully developed training we saw was Japanese Kodi Ubujis. So we took principles, not methods of cutting with a sword or thrusting with a spear, but what did the Japanese do in the Sengoku period when they had to fight on the battlefield? How'd they use those systems? We took those principles and we applied them to today's fighting man. They work. They're 
incredibly effective. I've used them with law enforcement, high stress enforcement situations, and they work. My concern today, uh, the work we did with the Marine Corps, they refer to as combat mindset. My concern today is the Kori Ubujisu is being neglected by the Japanese. The concepts and changes it's undergone in the last 40 years I've been involved are dramatic. The majority of what we see now is dojo training. And I'm certainly not advocating that we go outside and actually put it to use with steel blades. But I would highly encourage anybody who's interested in looking at the field of hoplology, specifically for looking back at your own training. It can provide you insights that quite likely you've never thought about before. There is an incredibly valuable resource of information within the Kodi Ubujas. But unless we actively make the steps to go back and look at those resources, we're going to continue to look at Kodi Ubujisu as a museum artifact. We take that off the shelf a couple times a week, dust it off a little bit, end of training, we put it back on the shelf and go our happy way. Kodi Ubujisu has much more to provide us than a dusty tool. Thank you. It's fascinating. I think uh, people should understand there was an enormous depth uh, of information being shared there from uh, the initial thoughts around um, uh, on the development of hot wall uh, We have a few moments for questions. If anyone has a question, uh, please raise your hand and uh, Mike with the mic uh, will come to you. Well, first of all, thank you for your presentation. Uh, second of all, my question regards uh, some of the elements you've discussed about uh, police forces and law enforcement. Um, I've uh, spoken with a few uh, police officers and police instructors, which also seem to be putting focus on something that seems to be blending the line a little bit between civilian and martial, uh, in terms of, for instance, uh, obviously having a posture of re readiness in your posture, but at the same time, you know, using some form of vocalization, or at least that's how I interpreted it, uh, to be able to diffuse the situation before it actually re uh, reaches a point of. Uh, of uh, actual uh, aggression. Um, how would you categorize this? How would you fit this in the system that you've described today? Uh, that's a very good question. In fact, we worked with that problem. Most police officers, and if you've ever watched what cops, uh, in a confrontation situation, what does the cop start doing? Get on the ground, get on the ground, get on the ground. We start yelling. How would the warrior mindset deal with it? Lie down or I'm going to kill you. And literally what we did, we were working, like I say, with the Washington State Police, is we trained them very easily into maintaining their own calm demeanor and giving simple commands. As soon as I raise my voice and I'm staring at you in the eyes, how will you respond? Your voice is going to raise, you're going to stare me back in the eyes. We taught them, keep your eye on the... Zanchi. Don't focus on the opponent. Why? Because you don't know how many other guys are out there. Two, by keeping your demeanor calm, it causes a dissonance with the other side. They literally don't know how to respond. So is it martial or it's civil? Outcome. I'm not killing the guy. I am legally prohibited from killing him unless he presents a physical threat. So the outcome helps us look at that. It's a tool. The outcome is, I want to take control, but I don't want to damage. I have the weapons to do severe damage. But through good, civil, combative behavioral training. Civil combative behavior doesn't mean it's the antithesis of martial behavior. It, we can use that. And you've got to consider all human behavior is shades of gray, right? Nothing's as distinct, distinct ever as we'd like to see. 
So if I can borrow that behavior and make my job more effective, both for me and for the poor guy I'm about to beat the crud out of, I'd rather use that behavior. Thank you. <laughs> we have one more question up front. Hi, uh, there was a slide uh, you're quoting from from Don Dreger. I think it was uh, talking about the difference between Bouguer and Budo, uh, and there was the phrase uh, Budo is deriving from classical plebeian. I was wondering if you could expand a bit more on why why, why plebeian. The word plebeian. <laughs> His point was, and he was he was a man of intentional points. All right, plebeian meaning is post battlefield. It might be a system that's evolved from the battlefield, but it's involved now with people who are no longer battlefield warriors. They might be from the hereditary class of the samurai, but their aims in their systems are plebeian. Furthermore, many of the systems that we call Budo evolved well after Sengoku period. We all know that. So are those martial battlefield-based systems? And I don't mean to insult anybody because people often make the mistake of thinking we're talking about, well, this is a good system because it's battlefield. And this happened during the 70s when Drager wrote these books. People were very upset because their systems weren't jutsu, they were do. And a lot of us, I was in karate do, no doubt about it. As soon as I read that book, well, actually, I was in karate jutsu. <laughs> All right. It worked. You have no idea how many people went from being in Aikido to Aikijujutsu, Aikijutsu, or what have you. Because why? It impacts upon my self-identity, which is tied to my group. So again, these aren't comments or statements of good, bad, or indifferent. They're tools that help us assess actions and behaviors. Anybody else? One, one question here. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I've um, I've often wondered if we put too much on the Koryu Bujutsu folks and the Budo, in the in the sense that that uh, you use the example of the Marines, a young training a young Marine. Well, I trained a bunch of Army guys, um, they, and the, certainly the Romans worked in teamwork. Uh, right. They they would practice. <clears throat> excuse me. The day before a battle, they'd go in to play a game. It was kind of like cage ball, except they killed people. Um, and the idea was to, to develop a team spirit and a cooperation. But you've got the extreme of the Marines that control every aspect of a young Marine's life. Right. And then you're trying to put uh, some of these attributes on people who do this a couple of times a week with some guy who's probably too old to do much of the uh, uh, techniques it's, himself. It's, again, it's, it's not about the physical side. It's about the mental side. There's, a retired warrior doesn't make him less a warrior. He might not be as physically adept anymore, but the mindset can be the same. Well, if I could finish what I was going to say, it's the, if you go to Kumamoto, for example, in the Ren societies where young samurai would band together and had a warrior society that expected every one of them to practice martial arts and then would critique each other based on that. And there was, an, there was something outside of simply the martial arts. And I don't, I don't see much evidence that all of that has uh, survived the Meiji Restoration, much less the two or 300 years uh, interval. But anyway, it's a very interesting study um, when you when you do extrapolate to the world. Thank you very much for the comments. Um, I'm going to stop it there, Chip. Again, thank you very much. I don't think uh, anyone was ever named more appropriately than uh, Hunter Armstrong. Oh, I uh, thought you were talking about Chip, and I was going to wait. No, I, was gonna, <laughs> I didn't say that at all. As an Englishman, I like my chips, but no, that's, uh, that's another story.